Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us is Omar Shakir. He is uh, the Israel and Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch. Uh, Omar, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let's just start um, so that people understand the context of this. I mean, obviously, uh, folks are aware and have, have heard the stories, and I want to get the latest news that you've heard uh, coming out of Gaza. But I, I don't know if people fully understand what what Gaza is. Like, wh how did Gaza become Gaza? Well, thank you for asking that question. I've done dozens of these interviews and nobody starts with that. So thank you. Um, so Gaza is a 25 by 7 mile strip of territory that's currently home to about 2.2 plus million Palestinians. 70% of the population are refugees who were forced um, out of their homes or expelled um, in 1948. They came to Gaza. They've been there ever since then. Since 1967, the Israeli government has occupied uh, the Gaza Strip. Um, they have maintained control over the Strip. They did so through direct military rule until 2005. And since then, they've uh, exercised primary control over Gaza through control over the movement and uh, people and goods, through control over the airspace, the water space, control over the population registry that issues IDs, and many, many other levers. Since 2007, the Israeli government has imposed a closure or a blockade on Gaza. So it's a generalized ban on travel. Nobody can enter or exit absent narrow humanitarian exemptions. And they've also been sweeping restrictions on the movement um, of people, uh, of goods, sorry. Um, and all of which has contributed to a reality before October 7th in which 80% of Gaza's population relied on humanitarian aid. Human Rights Watch has also concluded that the closure of Gaza that I mentioned is unlawful, it violates international law, and we found that Palestinians, including the population of Gaza, um, are uh, suffering from the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution imposed by the Israeli government, as well as we've documented numerous abuses by Hamas authorities, who have become the de facto uh, and de facto control over Gaza since the 2007 split with Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. And we found that they've also committed serious uh, crimes, including vis a vis Palestinians in Gaza, arbitrary arrest, and torture of critics, opponents, and dissidents. All right. And just, uh, and just to be clear, so I just want to, because I mean, I've had many conversations with people, and there's a reason why they, you know, they call Gaza like the world's biggest uh, open air prison. And a lot of people just don't don't have an awareness of this, did not know. I mean, Gaza existed. There was a, a Gaza city, um, but uh, in 48, many of, in uh, uh, you know, I, I think it was five towns uh, were uh, essentially of, of Palestinians were essentially uh, made refugees and went into Gaza. And so when we say 70 percent, but but half are under um, are half are under the age of of 18. It is children of 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 descendants yes. of that of that era. So there, seventy percent of the people are there because they were made refugees with, um, uh, you know, during what is known as the Nakba, yep. or uh, from the Israeli perspective, they're you know they're essentially um, cleansing those towns of of uh, of Palestinians, um, and and also uh, to be clear, let's just. I, I just want to, and, and before we go to where we are presently, and we've been joined uh, by David Dayan uh, uh, through the, the wonders of technology. We've expanded that window. Um, but uh, the in 2000, uh, w when the Israelis unilaterally decided to end their occupation, and they basically did so, it was a rather surprise. It wasn't done in coordination with anybody on the ground that would, you know, it's, I think people can understand very difficult to build a civil society um, when you go from occupy, being occu fully occupied to not, uh, uh, virtually overnight. Um, the Bush administration was really pushing, the George W. Bush was really pushing for elections at that time. And if my understanding is that, in, uh, that uh, largely the Palestinian leadership was like, we need time to build up something here because Hamas, in addition to having this, uh, you know, militant uh, te terrorist wing also was providing social services in many respects. And for people who are completely uh, without options, 
if someone's uh, handing out food and your kids are starving, that's how you, t you take it. Will you just walk us through that sort of dynamic at that time as well? Yeah, and, and uh, I just want to correct one thing. Your statement was, was, was right on point. I would just say the occupation didn't end in 2005. Actually, the ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross, the UN uh, states still consider Israel to be the occupying power in Gaza by virtue of their control. But basically what took place, and this was during uh, Ariel Sharon's reign as prime minister, is he made a decision unilaterally to withdraw the about 8,000 settlers that were living in the Gaza Strip. Um, at the time and to withdraw the ground forces that were operating in Gaza. So instead of con directly militarily ruling over people and having a um, settler population as they do in the West Bank, they went to a different model of sort of controlling Gaza from the outside. Obviously, Egypt retains control over its crossing, um, you know, with Gaza, but has been operating in coordination, um, you know, with Israel. So to answer your direct question, what took place here, and, and this is um, was said by Sharon and his advisors at the time, is they made a decision primarily around control of demography. Human Rights Watch has found that control over demography and land is primarily underscored Israel's policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians for decades. It's at the heart of our finding of apartheid and persecution. So to use American political terms, they committed an act of gerrymandering. They basically decided to have 8,000 Israeli settlers in a sea of two plus, and now two million, back then it was less than that, uh, Palestinians, but it was still well over a million, was not demographically the right way to secure control. So instead, as part of a project to control um, the, the larger area of Israel in the occupied territory, they basically shifted those settlers. Some of them went to Israel, some went to the occupied um, territory. But the, 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 our conclusion, this was demographically driven, was actually not just you know the, based on the rhetoric, but also on the policy. So to give you one example, since um, the implementation of the closure policy, Israeli human rights groups have documented what they describe as the one-way ticket you can get, which is you can go from the West Bank into Gaza. For example, if they're not easily, by the way, there's generally a prohibition on movement. But in the few cases in which, for example, families have been allowed to reunify or where there has been moves of, of populations between West Bank and Gaza, it's only gone in the direction of Gaza. It's virtually impossible to get a permit to go from Gaza to the West Bank. Even if you're a football player, we've documented this with a match in Ramallah, or you're an artist that has an art exhibit, it's virtually impossible. And the only, and, and, and the Israeli government has been explicit in its policy documents, the army saying that that's basically presumptively not allowed for policy reasons, and the, and the Netanyahu government has said this. So I think it's important to understand, and this has been documented by human rights groups, uh, essentially Gaza as um, an act of um, sort of uh, population and ethnic uh, 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 engineering of population dynamics. And I think that's sort of an under understood dynamic. But that's not to say Israel doesn't have security considerations. Obviously, we're seeing what's happened, you know, over the last nine days. But to underscore that their po original policy impetus was about, you know, uh, uh, furthering control by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians in controlling demographics. And that also plays into what Netanyahu said in 2019, I guess, uh, allegedly behind the scenes to Likud members, that uh, empowering Gaza is important, uh, sorry, not empowering Hamas in Gaza is important for that purpose of driving a wedge between Palestinians in the West Bank and Palestinians in Gaza. Could you expand on that? And, and, and how fleshed out are the is the information that we have about both historical support for Hamas from the Israeli government or like a preferential treatment towards them um, versus just kind of the hodgepodge of quotes that I think we're able to cobble together in the wake of the, these atrocities? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's important. The Israeli government has been explicit that there's a policy goal of what's called the separation policy, a policy of separation. That's the Israeli government's own rhetoric, right? Because so long as the West Bank and Gaza, which, by the way, Israel during the Oslo Accords, which was now 30 years ago, recognized Gaza and the West Bank as a single territorial entity. So although they're disconnected legally, they're one entity. So you should be able to move between Ramallah and uh, Gaza City as you are able to move between, I don't know, Philadelphia and Washington. Hopefully the Wi-Fi on the Amtrak would be better in that case. But 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 seriously, it's one territorial entity, right? So, um, but the Israeli policy since 2005, and especially since 2007, has been a policy of separation. And there have been clear statements, Netanyahu made it on the campaign trail, that it serves the Israeli interest to actually have 
um, Hamas in the power that they're in. And again, you can look up these statements that's been made by the advisors, it's been made by, by, by Netanyahu himself. And actually, Israeli commentators have been noting that in some cases, what's happening now is a result of this policy. It's ironic in a sense, because the Palestinian Authority, which is in power in the West Bank, um, operates in coordination with Israel. They have a security coordination agreement. Some have even called them the outsourced arm of the Israeli occupation. Um, mm. But the Israeli government has not had for years, for a decade really, substantive negotiations and dialogue with the Palestinian Authority. Again, the Palestinian Authority Human Rights Watch has documented their own human rights abuses, and we're not taking one side or the other in terms of who to talk to. But the reality is until October 7th, the Israeli government had understandings, agreements, negotiations with Hamas authorities. There was a sort of way in which the reality of Gaza was managed. Obviously, October 7th has in some ways shattered that. And part of the bloodshed and violence we're seeing today is an attempt using human lives as bargaining chips, both by Palestinian armed groups and Israel to renegotiate that. And, and I just wanted to also ask you about this earlier because you mentioned uh, 1948 and the expulsion there. Um, this current uh, barrage of Gaza and the push to get um, uh, Gazans to go to the south so that they can be saved. I guess this is the is Israel's kind of PR about being magnanimous, but the reality is is that they want that territory uh, 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 to be cleared out for a potential ground invasion. Um, it's being described as the second Nakba. You mentioned the first one. Can you talk about why people are drawing that comparison? Yeah, I mean, people are drawing that comparison because um, in 1948, Palestinian communities either fled or were expelled with the prospect of the Israeli military, or if it was before the, you know, the formation of the state in mid-1948 by, by Jewish paramilitary groups, uh, of coming to invade their communities. So many of these populations, as, as was noted, um, are the same ones now living in Gaza, and they're being asked again to pack their belongings to leave with an impending Israeli military with, first of all, no safe place to go. Uh, Gaza is still sealed on all sides, no safe way to get there, and no indication of when they'll return home. You've seen the harrowing images of people with their life possessions on their back leaving. So for many of them, this harkens back to the memories of 1948. By the way, they were never allowed to return to their homes over mm -hmm. seven decades. So the idea that, you know, and, and as was noted again earlier, it's not just those people, it's their descendants, right? Their grand, their children, their grandchildren, in some cases their great grandchildren that are now facing this very same um, fate. So for many of them, and again, they're doing it not in a vacuum. They're doing it in which there has been relentless Israeli bombing of the Gaza Strip. More than 6,000 plus bombs by the Israeli army's own admission dropped on Gaza, some of which have reduced blocks, neighborhoods, homes to rubble. It's killed hundreds of civilians, hundreds of children. It's unspeakable the horrors that are there. And let me just say in concluding this point that the Israeli government has given indications and signals that it is planning even more, that it is planning mass atrocities because it is talking about the entire population of Gaza being responsible for the heinous crimes committed you know, by Hamas. And when we talk about evacuating an area, we're not talking about a neighborhood block. We're talking about half the Gaza Strip, home to more than one million people, including Gaza's you know, effective largest city, including its main hospital. Um, it is just, we're at a moment in which really um, we're, we're facing a prospect which seemed unfathomable of large scale atrocities in short order, and it needs to be stopped. Now, let, can, let, can, uh, can I ask a, a, a Yeah, question? I just wanted to, uh, let me just, let, uh, because you mentioned uh, this statement, which I, I think uh, presumably refers to um, what the Israeli president, uh, Isaac Herzog, uh, said uh, the other day. This was on Thursday in a, um, uh, in a news conference. We should say the, Isra uh, the, 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 the president doesn't have the authority necessarily that the prime minister does. Um, however, and there were other mitigating things, arguably, that the president said during this. But if you introduce this concept, let's play this. Um, it has um, the, just the introduction of this concept, I think, is really dangerous. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't want. Well, let's play it and then we can talk about it in the United Kingdom. You spoke very passionately about uh, saying that Israel was uh, not retaliating but targeting uh, w with regard to the operations in Gaza. 
Um, but even President Biden, who spoke so personally and passionately with regard, with regard to what was happening in Gaza, spoke about the importance of the laws of war and the humanitarian situation within Gaza. So with that in mind, what can Israel do to alleviate the impact of this conflict on two million civilians, many of whom have nothing to do with Hamas? First of all, we have to understand there's a state, there's a state in a way that, was a, that has built a machine of evil right at our doorstep. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true. This rhetoric about civilians not, we, we're not aware, not involved, it's absolutely not true. They could have risen up, they could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat, murdering their family members who were in Fatah. There's a short memory in the world. Israel evacuated Gaza unilaterally in order to show that it's willing to make peace. I was a member of that cabinet. We said to our nation, this will be Hong Kong of the Middle East. Well, reality has turned into a tragedy. I, I, I want you to respond to that concept of like, you know, I mean, first off, yeah, I think it would be news to folks in Gaza that they are a nation. Um, exactly. And uh, exactly. I mean, he, had to, he said they're a state in a way. And the in a way part is that they have none of the things that you need to provide for your citizenry, uh, like an ability to control your economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have control over your electricity. Have let's elections say. for the but, you know um, not just eighteen years. But after. but the idea of an entire nation of all the civilians being responsible in a non democratic situation it is the case. I think that like a a plurality of people in polls support uh, Hamas. Uh, but but can you talk about this concept? Like who else? <laughs> Are there any civilians in any society that would not be um, liable for this type of an attack or where it would not be legitimate to be attacked uh, if we were to uh, operate under this rubric? You know, Sam, um, and I should say it's not just the Israeli president in isolation. The defense minister uh, used incendiary languages about human animals. Just earlier today, you had Israel's energy minister uh, Israel Katz, who implemented the cuts to electricity, water, and fuel, saying, and I'm just going to quote his tweet, Hamas is robbing the humanitarian aid to the Palestinian people. There is no reason to give them anything until we eliminate Nazi Hamas. There was Israel's um, defense, uh, sorry, UN ambassador on CNN on Friday that spoke about, um, let's remember that the, the people of Gaza voted for Hamas. Let's also, just to add to the point you raised, Sam, uh, the majority, half of Gaza's population are children who weren't even born at the time in which the last elections that they talk about take place. But the larger point is the one that was, is the one that you raised. I mean, uh, you know, I hate to even make this comparison, but this was the logic, you know, Osama bin Laden used to attack the United States, right? To say that the United States voted for the government committing these atrocities abroad. It was heinous then and it's heinous now. It's heinous to hold an entire population responsible for the acts of individuals. Let's be crystal clear, right? Hamas's deliberate killing of civilians, taking of hostages, shooting at crowds, these were heinous acts that have zero justification. There are war crimes, the perpetrators should be held to account. But what the Israeli government is calling for is not that. They're calling for revenge, using incendiary language and holding the entire population of Gaza responsible. That is a that is a war crime. It's 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 collective punishment as a starvation, as a weapon of war. The rules of war were precisely created to provide standards that everybody could adhere to. And they have basic principles that civilians should never be targeted and that one side's war crimes do not justify your your, your war crimes. Power imbalances don't justify war crimes. Everybody has to adhere to the same set of rules. They include distinguishing between civilians and combatants. They include uh, avoiding indiscriminate attacks, uh, disproportionate attacks, 
targeting civilian infrastructure. We need these rules to be followed, um, and they're not. And we're here precisely because of decades of flagrant disregard for the international humanitarian law. Well, and and speaking of the rules of war, uh, you know, your organization has made one of the more extraordinary findings here uh, of this of this conflict: the use of white phosphorus by the Israelis. The the Israelis have denied this finding. Uh, I, I'm I'm curious because there hasn't been much uh, outcry to to my knowledge maybe you know better than i from the international community on this um uh, could you talk about you know what the nature of your evidence is for that and 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 what you've heard from other actors whether in the region or in europe or, or anywhere uh about this uh, really uh, remarkable finding yeah, I mean, look, we started receiving video reports that white phosphorus was used. So we have a multi-step verification process for this. I was in, uh, originally skeptical that it was used, given the history of this issue. The Israeli government, by the way, denied using in 2009 when we documented it, and many others later came to show that it was used, and it led to litigation in the Israeli system and restrictions on its use. So when we st started seeing the videos, the first um, step we did was to verify the authenticity of the video. Was this taken in Gaza at the time that was put forward? We have a digital investigation lab with expertise in precisely video verification. The first thing we did was verify some, not all the videos, some of the videos that we saw on social media. The next step was we ran it by our munitions experts. We have a team, an arms division at Human Rights Watch that reviews, uh, that's experts on weapon systems, decades of experience in conflict. They confirmed that what they saw looked like white phosphorus that you know all the, the the visuals and everything matched their view of white phosphorus step three is that you had to talk to people in the affected areas and see how they describe what they saw and smelled and um we did interview people in the port area of gaza city where white phosphorus was used and they had an account consistent with the use of white phosphorus so those three things together led us to conclude uh that white phosphorus was used we were not the only ones amnesty international reached a similar conclusion as have other journalists um and why is white phosphorus so problematic it causes excruciating burns uh, that causes lifelong suffering. It can burn also homes and other structures. Um, and when it's used in a densely populated area, it's unlawful because it is indiscriminate. It can it affect everybody uh, within a radius of where it strikes, even when it's not used as a weapon, even when it's only used for obscuring or for camouflage, um, it can still have this effect. And that's why um, you know the Israeli court system, in effect, a decade ago, uh, restricted the Israeli army's use of it. And actually, the, 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 the crazy part about all this is Israel has non-lethal versions of other substances that can have the same obscuring effect without the effect on civilians. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, to answer the second part of your question, it's not just with white phosphorus, but the international community, I think quite shamefully, has failed to take a principled position when it comes to international law. They were rightfully horrified by what Hamas did. Their condemnations, though, kind of stopped there. When it came to even the most basic calls that you see in other situations, right, adhere to international humanitarian law, allow in humanitarian um, aid, um, don't cut electricity, water, um, you know, avoid uh, dis indiscriminate attacks like with the white phosphorus, They've been lacking. You've seen people backpedaling a bit in the last two, three days where you're starting to see that some of these statements issued. But one, the damage has been done and two, much more needs to be done. We're now talking about the prospect of large scale atrocities and action is needed to stop them. Yeah. Uh, can I ask, uh, I mean, there's, I guess, a somewhat uh, mechanical uh, question, but uh, as um, fuel reserves uh, dwindle, as electricity is cut, as I imagine, you know, people have the spare batteries for their phones and uh, means of contact. How do, does your organization, I mean, this is a similar question in terms of like what would happen uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, reporting. But uh, because, I mean, presumably, um, I, I have not heard reports that there are able, you know, uh, that press outfits are able to get in and sort of replenish uh, reporters that might be there in terms of like, uh, I don't know, phones or batteries or whatever it is. How are, like, are you both uh, aware of like a diminishing number of reports uh, to your organization coming out of Gaza? And like, how do you deal with this? 
I mean, it's you you flagged a huge issue. I mean, there is no foreign journalists that are they're getting in. There have been, according to the Palestinian Journalist uh, Union, I think 11 Palestinian journalists that have been killed um, so far uh, um, in, in, in the process. Uh, of, of the, this nine days. So, you know, even Palestinian human rights groups on the ground, who we often rely on and partner with in their documentation, they've issued urgent alerts the last several days that for the first time in their history, they're not able to do their normal documentation because their field workers are running for survival. They're trying to, you know, feed families and survive relentless bloodshed. So not only are foreign journalists not in, not only do local human rights groups not have access, by the way, human rights groups um, since for Human Rights Watch since 2008, the Israeli government has let us in one time. I mean, foreign staff. We had we have local staff, um, you know, on the ground. So it's incredibly difficult for us to, you know, get information. So um, and, and and as we speak, uh, for example, the generators that people are relying on for backup power, those are running out of fuel. It's a matter of hours before they run out. And when that happens, the last sort of vestiges, unless we get an influx of urgently needed humanitarian aid, which, by the way, you can't just have aid and water. You need electricity, right, even to operate the power plants. You need the infrastructure for the water to get there, which has all been damaged. So the Israeli government is, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of laughing off the intelligence of the international community when they make announcements, which, which by the way, we haven't verified that they partially resumed water uh, services in part of one area of Gaza. Um, you know, uh, because if you don't have the electricity, if you don't have the other aspects of aid, it's not going to help. But yes, the electricity and the internet outages, all of which again are unlawful, are creating a problem with getting basic information out of Gaza. Is that part of the, the point? Like, I mean, uh, that uh, it's it, it appears that we're I mean, the bombing has been indiscriminate based on what we know um, uh, uh, and, and continues. But the ground invasion has been delayed. Right. Or or the because it still has not happened yet. It's likely to do. There were massive um, uh, rainfalls in uh, Israel and I believe in Gaza over the weekend, which potentially delayed it. But um, is there any other reason that uh, th this has not gone forward yet? I mean, are, is 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 it of your opinion that they're waiting until those outages are a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, solidified? Are they trying to do this under the cover of night? W what's your sense of how things are right now based on the limited information you have? You know, as a human rights lawyer, I can't, you know, I'm not well placed to sort of speak about military strategy other than to say that, you know, there are obviously a lot of considerations here. Um, you know, I think negotiations are clearly happening with the United States, you know, with other states. I think there's obviously the fate of the hostages. Uh, and we should talk about that. I mean, you know, we're talking about scores of Israelis, women, elderly uh, that are being held. That's unlawful. International humanitarian law is clear. They should be immediately released. So there could be concerns about the hostages. There could be, uh, you know, a desire to, um, you know, to, yes, to, for, their, for, for there to be a certain reality on the ground that's not met. I, I can't speak to that other than to underscore that the bombing has not stopped. So, and in fact, in many ways, it's continued at a more accelerated rate. People have been bombed trying to uh, leave the northern part of Gaza on the approved routes, according to the local, um, you know, Gaza Health Ministry. Um, you know, we continue to see massive bomb bombardment and destruction. So I don't know, um, frankly, and I would be speculating about why, when and why the ground invasion will or might not take place other than to say that um, even even if it doesn't, we're already seeing massive civilian casualties and destruction of civilian infrastructure. If it does happen, there's certainly a risk of the casualty account, which is in the thousands already continuing, if not increasing at an accelerated rate. We're in an unprecedented descent into darkness. Um, l let me ask you this question. Um, w w and, and this is obviously it's not your job. Um, but, um, uh, one of the things that, um, you know, there is a sense that obviously every country has the right to defend themselves. Um, and what would, from your perspective, and, and again, I know this is not your job and maybe it's an unfair question, but what are the other options for Israel here? Aside from perhaps like, you know, whatever domestic pressures, uh, they may or may not have. Right. I mean, because that's, uh, I think, a very difficult thing for us to divine. I think we'll, we'll have guests on uh, later this week that will probably discuss 
the, that uh, sort of the swirling pressures within the context of, of Israel. But, it, but as a mechanism in which to ensure uh, Israeli safety, like what, what would, wh why should we have different expectations of what Israel would do? Sam, you know, it's interesting you raise that because there's something that's really not well understood, which is for the 16 years of Israel's closure policy, the strongest advocates for actually uh, easing or lifting the closure has been the Israeli army, not the political factors. The former director of the army in charge of Gaza called for a Marshall Plan of Gaza because Israeli security folk understand that starving a population, sealing it off from the outside world, um, you know, blocking people from any opportunity, any prospect of life from leaving. When you do that, you're invariably going to create a powder keg. And it's only a matter of time when you suppress, choke, strangle a people for years or decades in which that takes, um, you know, that, that, that manifests itself in really ugly and really heinous, you know, ways of acting. It's an unsustainable arrangement. Human Rights Watch has been saying you know, we've had these rounds of escalations and we've warned so many times that unless you deal with impunity for unlawful attacks and unless you deal with the underlying root causes, you know, including the closure of Gaza, Israel's apartheid against Palestinians, you're only going to see bloodshed and oppression continue. I hate that we're right. I wish it didn't. I wish it wasn't happening on an unprecedented scale. So I, I know I'm not directly answering your question, but I wanted to sort of establish again that we're here because the Israeli government put politics over what was in the best interest, not only the people of Gaza, right, which is to, to lift the closure, right? And this is not to say you let everybody in, everybody out. You know, obviously Israel can have individualized security assessments for entry to Israel, but to not let people in Gaza go to the West Bank, to not allow them to go abroad, to pursue degrees for, for art programs, when you stifle and kill hope for an entire people, you can't be surprised. I mean, let me give you one example. In 2018, you might remember the protest at the fence separating Gaza um, and Israel, in which Israel gunned down and killed many protesters. You know what Israel's answer to that was? They started, they pushed Egypt to open up Rafah, that crossing with Egypt, right? Like for five years, um, Post the military coup in Egypt, that border was sealed. But when the people of when Israel realized they needed an outlet for people to breathe, they opened Rafah, you know, and that 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 you know did help to some degree with some of the challenges faced by people there. So ultimately, yes, these attacks happen; they're heinous. The answer is accountability, right? You would have had great support, and Human Rights Watch should have been among the many others saying the perpetrators, those who ordered it, need to be prosecuted. They need to be held criminally accountable uh, for their actions, right? But to, to to take such an approach of holding all 2.2 million people in Gaza responsible for the actions of those responsible for seeking revenge in the ways that the Israeli government have signposted, that's unlawful and, and not the way to go. The way to, to, to respond to, to heinous acts of international law is not by committing your own heinous uh, violations of international law. It's by respect for international humanitarian law. And, and we should say, uh, from an efficacy standpoint, I mean, even if we were to, you know, uh, the, the idea that Israel will be able to enter into Gaza on the ground or do this by air... Uh, and kill approximately 30,000 Hamas fighters. I mean, it's, you know, assuming that they're even able to do that, the, it's going to involve so much more killing that it's almost unimaginable that we won't see a, you know, three to one for every one that they kill, they will, they will have destroyed. Uh, some 17-year-old or 15-year-old or 16-year-old or 14-year-old, 12-year-old's family, 10-year-old, who are going to uh, grow up in this context, it seems, uh, and continue this on, it really just becomes a question of whether there is a, uh, um, uh, I guess, a, a will to sort of do something different for a change uh, in, in this, you know, sort of uh, situation. Uh, I, 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 I don't. I don't have any illusions, but um, we really appreciate uh, your um, uh, your coming on, uh, Omar. Is there anything else you think that we should know uh, going forward at this point? 
Look, I think um, this has been a great discussion because I think we've talked about so many different angles of this conversation. I think I just want to end by, you know, unders underscoring the urgency here of, of the situation. It's, you know, we're talking about minutes, hours until, I mean, water right now, we're down to people are using water unfit for human cons consumption, which creates the real risk of, of waterborne illness. If fuel runs out of the hospitals, you have hundreds if not thousands that will lose their lives unnecessarily but we can't also just focus on that urgent situation we need to you know start in many ways where you guys started the conversation with the underlying context the closure the apartheid we need to understand that picture it's not to justify hamas's heinous attack there's no justification for that but the only way out um, is adherence to international law respect for human rights and accountability. And it, it might seem like this is what you expect the human rights guy to say, but I can tell you, having worked on this file for seven years, I've worked on, I've, I've documented mass killings of protesters in Egypt. I represented men detained in Guantanamo Bay. I can tell you, unless we do those things, we're not going to get anywhere forward. We're we, today, as we speak, we could be minute, you know, we could be a short way away from large scale atrocities at a scale we haven't seen. We have a chance to stop them. Raise your voice to do that. And, 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 and along those lines, um, uh, apparently um, members of Congress, including um, uh, Cory Bush and uh, Talib and Carson and uh, uh, Lee yeah, uh, yeah. Ramirez, have, have called for um, a, a ceasefire at this moment in terms of like, you know, folks listening to the program. Is that, you know, one of the best things that we can do at this point is contact our Congress people, have them push for the U.S. government to uh, call for a ceasefire? Look, I think, I mean, look, I think we absolutely need an end to unlawful attacks. We need humanitarian aid uh, to get in as soon as possible. We need electricity, water to get in. I think all these asks are important. And it's important that you're hearing from voices in Congress that are putting forward the sorts of common sense resolutions that we would do in any other context but haven't done here. It needs to happen yesterday. Appreciate uh, your time, uh, Omar Shakir, uh, Pal uh, Israel and Palestine Director at the Human Rights Watch. Thanks so Thank much you. for joining us. Thank you.